All right, welcome to a new episode of Becoming a Scrum Master. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. Joining me today, dear friend, trusted mentor, the gentleman who wrote the forward to Todd and I's first book. So, Mr. Steve Porter. Steve, always great to see you. I hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. Thank you very much for including me in this. Really excited to have a chance to chat with you, share some of what I know. And by the way, thanks again for asking me to write that forward. That, uh, yeah. that felt really great. Thanks. And if you haven't read the book, go read the book. Yeah. Get Fixing Your Scrum and read Steve's Brilliant Forward. No, it was really <laughs> nice of you to do that. I had a quick personal note is for Todd and I both, Steve was instr instrumental in getting us really? through the PST journey and encouraging us and inviting us. And so I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for Steve. And so, yeah, he's definitely been a big part of my journey. But the questions today are about Steve's journey. So yeah. the first question I have for you. So can you share the story of how you first encountered Scrum? What motivated you to become a Scrum Master? And was there any particular moment or experience that kind of sparked uh, this journey that we've been on? Yeah, uh, I'm a, my background's in software development. I've been writing codes uh, since I was a relatively a kid and I'm old enough that writing code when you're a kid for all the kids out there that's just normal back when I was a kid it was not normal I was a geek it was odd so I loved coding and went to go be part of my career went to go work for people doing that and I would spend a lot of my time learning how to code and then after I got I was getting good at this probably not, not the best word for it I discovered process I discovered a book on XP XP ah. was my very first non-coding book I ever read. I went and picked it up, read through and went, this is brilliant. This explains, I was working for a big insurance company, which was not agile. And when I read through the XP book, it's, this is brilliant. This is exactly what we should be doing. I think this is great. So I went back to the company that I was working with as a developer and said, hey, we should do this. This is awesome. And they're like, extreme programming? We're an insurance company. We don't do extreme here. I'm like, Ugh, crap. Okay. And then I learned about Scrum, specifically Scrum certifications, right? People have been around long enough to know that the Scrum Alliance has been around for a very long period of time and started offering certifications on Scrum. And when I learned a little bit more about it, I'm like, this seems familiar. There's a lot of it. There's a lot in here that was in this XP thing and they've got certification for it. I wonder if I might be able to get certified in this thing and then be able to slip in all of these XP practices in my insurance company, because then it's not extreme programming. It's this scrum thing that look, I've got a certification. So insurance company, you should be happy that I've gone and got certified on something. They love certifications. Okay. So my introduction to scrum was a back door for me to have a way to bring in a lot of those XP practices, which you need to do when you're doing complex work around software. So that was my introduction to Scrum. And uh, I started off just doing it, not necessarily being a Scrum master, but that was my, that was certainly my introduction to the, the framework. It's pretty wild. I think a lot of people, Todd and I included, found our way into Scrum through Kent Beck. <laughs> Extreme Programming Explained was our first books and or early books that we read too. And yeah, I think Kent brought a lot of people in early on trying to sneak technical yeah. excellence through the back door, right? Yeah, exactly. And I feel a little bad for Kent because those practices are great. I would, I might suggest he's got a branding problem. Maybe. Um, <laughs> around, around trying to get those ideas out to people. And I wish they would do as well as Ken and Jeff have done about getting people to embrace yeah. Scrum. And honestly, you and I have been around long enough that if you are working with a company and they're doing Scrum, if they're not doing XP, if they're not doing a lot of those practices, they're going to struggle. A lot. So a yeah. lot. Yes, a lot. So was there a specific project or situation where you had an, a eureka moment, you know, something that made you realize the true power and potential of Scrum? And if so, could you describe it? Yeah, there's obviously a whole bunch of, oh, isn't this great? But I'll share one that, that as a trainer, I often share with my students. And that's around this idea of having 
done increments. Like at the end of every sprint, having something, and we used to talk about potentially releasable, usable, useful, and value, all that stuff. That when you're finished the sprint, I got something. I was a product owner for a product company and that company was doing scrum and we were, I thought we were doing pretty good. Every two weeks we would have something that was shippable, potentially releasable. The way the company worked though, is putting something into the customer's hands, especially on mass was expensive. So we did six releases a year. Uh, but every two weeks we had something ready to go and we'd occasionally have customers who would have a challenge and we would be able to ship them built. Um, awesome. That were always current and that would not break anything they already had. I thought that was really great and really important. And where I really discovered that value is during one particular release cycle. So when we would promote a release to our customers, we would say things like coming in the spring of 2021, we were a little fuzzy on the dates when we were communicating to our customers, sometimes we'd say March, but we would never say on March 23, here's where you're going to get the, the release. Right. That's what we promoted to our customers. Internally, we had a date. It was going to be at the end of six sprints, boop, you're going to get it. One of the reasons we were a little bit fuzzy is occasionally it wasn't six sprints, it was five, or occasionally it wasn't six sprints, it was seven or eight, depending on the decisions we were making about how much value we were going to bundle up in that release. Getting near the end of the release, I think it might have been like we were planning out the last sprint. I'm looking at the backlog and as product owner, I'm like, ah, I'd really like to include this last handful of features to really make this release worth something. So sure. chatted with the head of sales and marketing and said, hey, we're going to this, we were planning for this date, we're going to push it another two weeks. And it was a, with the look on her face was like, you're doing what now? It's, yeah, we're going to push two weeks. We've done that in the past. Not a big deal, isn't it? It's, no, no, we can't do that. And it's like, what do you mean we can't do that? Like, we've done that in the past. She said, no, you don't understand. The end of our quarter is coming up. It's, yeah, so what? It's the end of the quarter is coming up. We need to make our numbers. Mm -hmm. And we've got sales that are dependent on having a release come up. And I'm like, well, we'll just push it two weeks. We're going to capture those sales anyway. It's, they're going to come. It's just going to be two weeks. And the look on her face is, no, you don't understand. We're part of a very large organization they want us to make our numbers. We want to make our numbers. So you need to release something and you need to release it by this date or we're in for a world of hurt. I'm like, crap. I'm, I'm, I was more of a product owner, not really a business guy, sprint, certainly not in a large corporate environment. This was my first experience with the, okay, we need to make our numbers. Yeah. So went back to my team, talked about what we were going to plan for that sprint, which was going to be the original sprint that and talk about the stuff that I was hoping to get into the next sprint that was going to be part of the real release talked with sales and marketing and said okay here's what we here's what I think we can fit into the release here's what I was hoping to get in but I won't be able to if we need to push it two weeks early or we need to get it now and when I chatted with sales and marketing and they looked at the stuff that was left they're like that's not that important we did the important stuff first scrum yeah. The stuff that the customers really wanted, the stuff that our sales and marketing people really wanted us to have for that release, it was all done. It was in the can. It was done sprints ago. So I said, okay, so how about we do the release on time? We have this. And those other things that I think are going to provide a lot of value, we'll just package them up and put out a little hot fix was the term we used. We weren't really fixing anything. Like we were adding new features. I'd really like to get that into our customer's hand. Can we do that the sprint afterwards? They're like, yeah, sounds good. Just as long as you've got something that we can put on our website, that we can promote to our customers, that we can yep. use to drive sales. As long as you've got that ready for that deadline, then we're good to go. Sorry for the long story, everybody, yeah. for talking about that. But that was the moment where I'm like, oh my God, thank God I'm not still working at that insurance company that would do waterfall <laughs> and do big bang, where that last two weeks, that last sprint that I had at that insurance company, that would have been testing. And the, hey, we're not quite ready yet. We need another two weeks would have meant we need another two weeks of testing, which means we can't ship. Like we have no flexibility then. Scrum gave me that flexibility that allowed me to get that thing out the door and hit our numbers. And guess what? We hit our numbers, yeah. which I thought was cool. Numbers matter, revenue recognition, all of those business terms. And 
What I love about your story, Steve, is that you're collaborating with those different aspects of the business and you're oh, getting yeah. their input and you're, you're actually like, it's a good story of uh, popping that scrum bubble. Go talk to sales and marketing, go. And that collaborative power and then scrum giving you the option of when to ship. That's just, it's awesome. Yeah. And honestly, sales and marketing were part of our team. It wasn't quite as cross-functional as I would have liked. They they weren't showing up to our dailies. They were they were certainly involved in sprint planning. Maybe not as hands-on as the people writing the software. They were certainly part of our sprint reviews. We would every sprint review we would hear from sales and marketing, and they would tell us what they were doing. And that was another eureka moment for me for how valuable it is to have the people building the product, in this case, cutting code, the people building the product here every single two weeks, we're doing two weeks, two weeks, to have them here every single two weeks, how is the product selling? What are they hearing from sales? To build that collaboration, build that bridge between people who are super important to the value of the product we were building. And to have those people have input into the sales and marketing process, like that cross-functionality is another case where the things that we tell people they should be doing, we were able to do a little bit of it to really see the benefit. Yeah, it, it sounds like that type of, of team experience and collaborative experience would definitely set that hook that would make you want to have more of that. And I think that's, yeah. that's such a good anchoring story that, you know, all right, now I'm a scrum person. This is because of all of the, the great things it led to. How has your perception and execution of the scrum master role accountabilities. I, yeah. I'm getting a little loose with the terms just for the general audience. Yeah. How has that evolved? And are there aspects of the role or accountabilities that you view differently now compared to when you first started? Yeah. So when I started with agile product delivery and working in small increments and trying to do done and all of that sort of stuff, it was almost I won't say it was pre-Scrum, but it, we didn't have Scrum Master. We didn't have a product owner. We didn't have all of, we didn't have the framework, certainly didn't have the Scrum Guide, didn't have all the frameworks in place, right? It was just, this is just a smart way of working. So we did those things. So for me, that evolution of the Scrum Master role, it started off with, there wasn't a role, there wasn't a title, there was nothing. It was just, I, I really liked helping people get better at doing things. So I would naturally take on the accountability to do those things because it, it excited me to help the business people I was working with, product owners, to help the people coding, right? The development team, to help the organization understand, here's what the things that we need to go and do stuff. I had a great, I worked at a consultant com consulting company and we were chatting about a new project that was coming up and they were thinking, right, who, who's going to be on this team? And someone said, we want Steve on the team. And someone else, someone um, from outside the pool, someone in management went, why do you want Steve on the team? And he's, I'm not exactly sure what he does, but every time he's on the team, things just seem to run a lot smoother. Yeah. That's a scrum master for me. So the evolution of this is it went from that to being a little bit more explicit to being a bit more, okay, I'm, that's my role. I'm going to put my scrum master hat on it. When people are looking for facilitation or looking to remove impediments. I would be a little bit more in the forefront because that's a hat I was wearing. I don't, I think only, I want to think only on one team was I ever the scrum master. Sure. And that, that was fine for me. Now the evolution for me, I, I almost have a feeling like we're going back to the, it's not a title that you have. It's not something that you hire. It's just, we need someone to do this thing. Who's going to be accountable for making sure that impediments are being removed, that the team is doing continuous improvement, that they're meshing well with the organization to grease the wheels, to remove those blockers. We need someone to do that. Who do we have that's going to step up and do that and, and in the best position to do that? You've heard me say this before, and I certainly talk about this in my training classes. Some of the best scrum masters I ever met we're just good line managers. Yeah. People who just, I've got a team of people. I want them to be successful. I have to report to someone who pay, who pays my salary. They're expecting this team to do well. I'm going to grease the wheels, 
facilitate events. Like I'm going to do all that stuff, but am I a scrum master? No, I'm, it's not my title, but yeah, you're a master. Yeah, and I, I'm hoping more organizations will view it that way, that we need someone to step up. Who's the best person to step up? Let's make it really clear. Okay, you're stepping up into this. Here's the things that you're accountable for. Go do your thing. Love it. Yeah, I, yeah, we're aligned there. I recently published a blog post about maybe your next scrum master should be your manager. And it yeah. caused an eruption, but it also, I think things are moving. As you said, I think things are shifting in that kind of direction. So yeah, the key piece for me there is that you need to have someone who's got some authority to get things done. Yep. And one of the dysfunctions I've seen in a lot of organizations is the scrum master as is knowledgeable, they're enthusiastic, they've got a lot of the right qualities, but they're not senior enough in the organization to actually be able to make stuff happen. Yep. And sometimes that manager title gives them the authority to go make things happen. And, and if you're a scrum master that can't make things happen, even if you want to make things happen, but you can't, you're not going to be very effective for your team and your organization. So anybody who's listening to this and you're trying to figure out who's going to be a good scrum master, find somebody who you trust to have the authority to make stuff happen. Because without that, you are potentially wasting your investment in the person that you're calling a scrum master. So that leads into the next question here, which so Steve, it's always great talking to PSTs because we tend yeah. to lead each other to the next question. It's yeah. what advice would you give to someone aspiring to be a scrum master? Is there a particular mindset, skill, or habit that you believe is crucial for success in this role or to fulfill the accountabilities? Yeah, it's interesting. You've taught the same class that I, same classes I taught, teach all the time. And one of the exercises we have people do is once they learn about the accountability, it's okay, what are good traits and skills for a scrum master? So the first thing for aspiring scrum masters is think about, do you have the right traits to, to be a good scrum master. And for me, curiosity, kindness, the, I've, I talk about having, I get this adverse reaction, almost like an itch when I see dysfunction, when I see things not going really well. So first ask yourself, do I have those traits? Cause if you've got that traits, it's a good start. If you don't have that trait, those traits, and you want to be a scrum master, you might struggle a bit because they're important traits to have. And then there's the skills, right? facilitation, negotiation, communication. So if you're looking to become a scrum master, if you've got the right traits, then add on those skills that will help you be more effective. And then in the organization you're in, uh, potentially ask for permission. It's, hey, I think I've got the right traits and the skills to do this. I would like to do this thing. Or you have the other, you have the other route, right? Just start doing it. Yeah. Just start helping people. Really, just start helping people. And hopefully the organization will notice. It's like, hey, this person is really good at helping people and greasing the wheels. And much like I was at that last or that last organization where they said, hey, we want Steve on this team because he just makes things better. If you want to become a scrum master, have those traits, have those skills, do those practices, and then you'll become the person that the organization naturally looks for when they're looking for someone to hold that accountability. Love it. It's great advice, Simple. Steve. I think the yeah. last thing that we get asked a lot, and so I'm putting it back on all of you, what is the one book every scrum master should read? It does not have to be an agile or scrum book. You don't have to say fixing your scrum. A lot of people have said it. I. <laughs> we'll put that in the show notes. Every, trust yeah, yeah. me. But aside from the usuals, like what are, what's the book every scrum master should? I hope Josh Seiden, uh, outcome over output. I yeah, think you might have read that book. I hope I get the yep. get that one right. There's lots of books you could read. I really enjoyed that one. Josh is an awesome guy. He helped us with a course, and that book it was a relatively short read, and it changed the way that I look at how you build product backlogs, how you measure all of those sort of things. That's something that if you haven't read it, go read it. I think it will help become you know, help make you become a better professional. Excellent. Steve, I appreciate you doing this. Those are the yeah. questions. Anything you would like to promote or anything you would like to bring to the forefront of the listener or viewer? Spend time 
if you're interested in the Scrum Master accountability, if you want to do these things, spend time learning and talking to other people, find a community to get part of. There are lots of social media opportunities, things like LinkedIn. Don't get too worried about, don't get too caught up in the negativity there. <laughs> Just try to find opportunities to learn from people because no matter how old you are, how long you've been doing this, no matter how much of an expert you think you are, there's always opportunities to learn more. So just go to look for opportunities to talk to people, listen to people, ask questions, and you'll slowly get better at what you're doing. Great. Thanks, Steve. We appreciate you. Yeah. Always good to talk. Excellent. If you enjoyed this discussion and subscribe, hit that bell so you don't miss future discussions with great PSTs like Steve. Be sure to check out the videos that are popping up. That's our free Scrum Master and free EBM course. They are totally free for you to use. Get you a great start down that career path and down that journey of Scrum. But leave us your questions and comments. We love questions and comments. We can talk forever about these topics. So if you have a question for me or Steve, leave it in the comments below. Maybe we'll get Steve to come back and follow up if there's enough uh, questions there. For Steve, I'm Ryan. Go forward, do some great Scrum things. Uh, keep learning. Steve's a continuous learner that came out beautifully in his uh, answers. Keep reading, keep learning, keep engaging, and uh, we'll see you next time.